So I remember a day where I went to the ATM. I was uh, trying to check. I knew I'm like almost at the border line, like I'm almost running out of money. But then the card wasn't working and I got like upset and I was trying to like smash it in or something like that. And the card broke. <laughs> <laughs> this card is like from a bank in, 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 in Pakistan, right? There's no way I can replace it. And I remember that moment as like a low moment in my life. Just, like, what the hell are you doing, right? Like, where are you? What country is this, right? Like, you don't speak the language. Like, what are you hoping to achieve? Hello folks, Jason Yanowitz here. I'm one of the co-founders of Blockworks and you're listening to Empire. Today, I sat down with Munib Ali, who's the CEO and co-founder of Blockstack. He's raised nearly $100 million to basically redefine what the internet looks like. Punch that subscribe button. You're listening to episode one of Empire. Let's jump in. A lot of people know about stacks and what you're working on and what you're building and you're very transparent and we'll get into that. Um, I, I want to talk in this episode a little less about stacks and what you're building and a little more just about your story from working in academia and uh, growing up in Pakistan. So maybe I think we could start there. Can you just give me a background on what it was like growing up in Pakistan and tell us a little bit about your childhood? For sure. So I grew up in a, a small city in uh, in Pakistan. It's right next to Islamabad. So Islamabad, more people know about it. It's, it's kind of like the capital city. And Rawalpindi is a almost like a twin city right next to it. Uh, it's very uh, influenced by the army. It's like a small army, sleepy town. And my dad, he comes from a village, right? My dad's brother, he still lives in a village and is a farmer. And my dad was the only person from that village that effectively, you know, got higher education and got into the army and so on. So I think the uh, the delta shift between kind of like where I come from, from the sleepy town, Raul Pindi, that nobody knows about to New York is actually much smaller than the delta shift of my dad growing up in a, in a village with no electricity. He didn't even have electric bulbs and he was trying to study at night and that's a, that's a struggle. Uh, what what we that delta shift is actually much bigger than the delta shift that I've experienced, but I have also experienced that. Like I think my uh, sleepy hometown of Rawalpindi, uh, basically there wasn't wasn't much to do there, and I I was lucky enough to actually somehow like I got into computers, and I was uh, I was kind of like stubborn enough that I kept nagging my parents uh, to get me one, right, and and I also remember the kind of sacrifices they gave like i think i i forget what was the uh what was the exact sacrifice but it was something like you know the the washing machine was broken and my mom was saving up for it but then she spent the money on my computer and didn't didn't fix the washing machine or something like that right like it, it's like uh we we had kind of like all the comforts in the world but obviously uh you know it's like you're just living month to month and every uh you know, the last last week of the month, we remember as kids, like we, we have learned not to ask for anything, right? So we're not going to the grocery store. We're not we're not buying anything until like it's it's the, it's the first of the month. And we, and we were really like happy as kids. After Afterwards, we look back and see that, oh, those were actually, you know, uh, tough times from a, both like a financial perspective and also like, you know, as a kid, you don't know you're growing up in a third world country, right? Like you, for you, like you think that's that's how the world is. And you slowly start discovering like what else is out there. And for me, the internet was really kind of like the uh, almost like the window into the rest of the world. And the, the first time I actually came online, it was kind of interesting. When I got the computer, I actually uh, didn't have the budget. Like you had to assemble these things, right? So these are these are like you, you buy all the parts. And uh, so I'm, I'm getting like a cheaper hard drive. I, I don't have enough RAM. And then I'm like trying to figure out how do I slowly upgrade my computer? But one of the biggest things was how do I get a dial up modem? Uh, installed, right? Internet was pretty pretty expensive back then, and I had some connection with with my friends through which we got access to um, almost like uh, some corporate hacked accounts, which were free at night. Like in the sense that that company is actually not using it. So part of me felt bad that I'm actually stealing the internet from somebody, but part of me was like, wait, they're not using it at night anyway, right? So I would only use that at night, and I would stay up all night every night 
so I, I would be a zombie like uh, during the day and my parents like sometimes they even thought like maybe you know I'm, 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 I'm smoking up or doing something at night <laughs> and like, a, like, a, like a zombie every day but I was just glued to my computer and it was a it was a fascinating world because uh, like at that point like joining the internet and I, I believe 97 is when I came online um, it was still early on the internet right so in, in, in some regards I did experience the early internet uh, Netscape was the first browser or made account on Hotmail and then IRC servers and I, I very quickly I think um, I just had this like knack for computer science that I wanted to know how things work like behind the scene I on my computer like I would install Linux and I would start trying to program it right like how does it work same with the internet like instead of like chatting on IRC I would start running IRC servers or trying to like modify them and, and writing chatbots or stuff like that so I think that that uh, journey of like just trying to learn more and more about how the internet works was basically like a it's like a never-ending thing and in many ways I'm still doing the same stuff right like uh, we are, we're trying to build almost like next generation internet protocols but uh, in my mind there's a clear line from uh, connecting to the internet for the first time and wondering about how does this work and how can I modify it to to today where you know we know how the internet works and we also know how it's broken and how, how can we fix it and how can we improve it. Okay, so 1997, you're a kid, you're playing around on Netscape's new browser, you're messing around with Hotmail, you've got a TV in your home, uh, I think as the story goes, and you had maybe one or two or three channels. And what, what was kind of the information that you were receiving and that families were receiving through maybe TV or radio or the newspapers? Like, what, what was that like? Was it pretty state controlled? Yeah. So Pakistan went through a bunch of these phases where, uh, you know, we'll have a democratic uh, government and then the military would just like overthrow them. It was cycles, right? Like every four to five years, the military would actually take over. And, and, and the general population in the country, uh, they were actually, the sentiment was they were more on the side of the military than the democratic uh, leaders because they thought that, you know, the leaders are corrupt whenever they come into power, like things actually break more and they would look up to the, the, the military as a more disciplined institution that basically has, has, has their shit together, right? And whenever they come into power, mm -hmm. uh, things become more organized and you know, they, they kind of like know what they're doing. But then very quickly, whoever the, the general that kind of like takes over command, like they would go through the honeymoon period to then everyone starting to hate them as a, as a dictator. And then somehow they would then try to remove that. And it's like a cycle, right? Like every 10 years, like this is happening again and again. And so in the, in the, in the nineties, we, we basically kind of like came, recently came out of that because of General Zia, who, who was, who was kind of like a dictator like that. My, my dad actually reported to him in, 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 in uh, through like two layers or three layers or something like that. I remember the day actually, like the, when I was a kid, this is, this is before, uh, before I got a computer and all that, when uh, there was the news of a plane crash in which he died, right? And my dad is sitting there and like suddenly, you know, you're, you're the chief of the army, the, the, the president of the country was in a plane crash and, you know, he died and there's like silence everywhere. But from a political perspective, like you're only hearing the news that is coming out of the national television. That is the only source of news, right? So as a kid, um, that's all we know, right? Like later on, like I've read books about the incident or, you know, what, what else could have happened. But at that time, like that's the only thing, thing we knew. And to, to highlight kind of like, you know, uh, how, how powerful uh, army could be, let's fast forward like 10 more years after, after General Zia. We have a democratic leader, uh, Nawaz Sharif, and he's having some sort of a tussle with the then army chief. Right. And the army chief, actually, he lived kind of like four or five blocks away from where we were. You can't even go there, right? Like, it's very hard to like even get close to that house. But, but physically speaking, it was like not that far away. And one day I remember I was, I was like 16 or something. I'm driving back and I see an insane amount of military presence. And um, there is an announcement uh, that was coming on the state controlled television saying that the the prime minister has fired the army chief and the new chief was actually my dad's classmate we we knew him 
he came from an engineering background. My dad is also from an engineering background with an army. And in the in the in the fifty year history of Pakistan, there has never been a chief of the army staff who comes from an engineering background. So it was very odd that why would why would the engineering corp uh, suddenly be the next kind of like chief of army? It just didn't it just didn't feel right to us, right? So what happened was the prime minister is trying to fire uh, Musharraf, who's the the chief of army. And he's trying to do it when Musharraf is out of the country and he's coming back. The news goes out that, you know, you've been fired and there's a new, and and they're trying to get a new chief. All the generals are declining that I am not going to be the new chief. Right? Huh. And the reason that, that, that the person who is from the engineering corp actually took it is because everybody else declined. <laughs> and that, that, that's why it was like so surprising that why why is this even happening and i was surprised like why would you even do that right like you would you would you would just like stick with the army because the army is not gonna let this go down like that easily so musharraf is like circling the karachi airport and he's calling up like his his commanders like the generals like every major city has generals his uh uh court commander for for, for the for the karachi city he shows up takes over the airport where they were they weren't letting him land he takes over the airport musharraf lands right and then they talk to the corp uh, commander in in the rawalpindi islamabad area they take over the prime minister house and they 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 put the prime minister like basically in a in in a car and what i saw was actually the prime minister being brought into the army enclaves that how dare you try to fire our army chief and the broadcast that was going online basically went blank for like 30 minutes effectively the army like took over the the television stations and then there was a new broadcast that you know there's no new army chief there's a new prime minister and and, and, that, and like you're just sitting there right and and that's that's like where information sources come in that if you only have like a state controlled television like it was effectively like all they had to do to control information was like take over the the it's called ptv like pakistan television they just took it over and it went blank for a while whenever you know whatever was going on in, in, in the backseat and then they came back online saying that hey this is what happened so you have uh ptv of pakistan tv you get on the internet you're using this new netscape browser do you remember when you this kind of aha moment of saying oh my god there's there's a whole world out there and this information that i've been receiving my entire life maybe maybe there's more to this thing do you, do you remember right. that moment? I think I think for me that moment was it actually came from IRC, Internet Relay Chat. Uh, it, it is basically a actually a fairly decentralized protocol uh, for chat online. The way the chat would work is that anyone can run a server, right? And a server would have a certain capacity of how many how many connections the the server can take. And some servers would become more. Um, more popular than others, right? It's, it's a little bit like bulletin board, like how many people are talking on one bulletin board versus another, but it's a real-time chat. People from all over the world would be on it. They wouldn't use their real names, right? So you'd come up with some sort of a online persona and and uh, you're completely hidden behind your online persona. So I would like get to talk to people who live all over the world, like even in Canada, the US or Europe or other places. And then it was very interesting to actually make friends who basically don't know what you look like, where you're from, right? But it was really about the ideas and the topics and the discussion, which I found intellectually like super interesting. And I would, I would learn a lot from these people. I started uh, having conversations with some people where they would effectively say something and I'll be like, no, this is not what happened in history, right? Uh, because mm -hmm. I was taught like a different version of history in my school because the military dictators, when they would be in control, they would actually read like the books to the extent of like, you know, it's it's not even factual at certain points. It's like someone is like pulling the rug under, under you that, hey, that thing you believe in that happened, that actually didn't happen, right? Or something else happened that was actually very horrible and it was covered up. It's it's like wake, waking up in the matrix, like, wait, what, what else is not true? And I think that was, that, that just stayed with me, right? Like I just started questioning authority in every single possible way. As a teenager growing up, it did mean that I, at some point I started having kind of like this tension with my family where I, 
they had certain ideas about which engineering universities are good and I should go there. And I'm like, no, I actually did my own research and you know, here's a new university that is actually way better and I'm only going to go there. And they're like, what are you talking about? You're like 16, 17, right? Ended up going to a uh, relatively young university is called uh, LUMS. And it was built basically by some of the most successful uh, like business personalities and industrialists in the country who had this pain point that they would have to send their kids abroad for quality education. They were like, why don't we create this university so that you know our kids can get that quality of education, but they can also kind of like stay uh, close to us. It was, it was like unbelievable that how could it exist during the late 90s in a country like Pakistan, like it was, it was, it was like a bubble. It was like a complete bubble, and but in in some ways, like that was my bridge to the rest of the world, uh, because I feel like my undergrad education was actually on par to a lot of the really good uh, U.S. universities as well. So let let's fast forward a little bit. So you've got you've got a, your dad. Your father comes from this kind of engineering background, but also you know reported up to this dictator. There's a little bit of tension, it sounds like. I think you went to Sweden, if I have this correct, and then over to Princeton. Are your parents supporting you throughout this time? Or are you kind of, you know, I'm not following authority, I'm out on my own right now? I think um, in, in some ways, like, my parents were concerned about what I'm doing with my life. I do think that, um, like, my, my mom, for example, she's been joking for a very long time. She'd be like, like, she would ask me that, hey, are you, are you, when are you planning on getting a real job, right? <laughs> and I would say that, hey, my time is too valuable to work for anybody. And she would just like laugh and she'd like, nobody's willing to pay you. <laughs> and, and you think that your time is too valuable <laughs> to actually work for somebody, right? They were, I think, largely supportive, like even financially. I, I think one of the biggest sacrifices that my parents made was um, like the biggest savings they had was actually a piece of land. Right, um, and they had to sell that to pay for my college education, which I'm, wow. you know, insanely, insanely grateful for. Like it's basically like saying, "Hey, we've been saving up all our lives, and now we're going to sell this thing because uh, Muneeb wants to go an ex- to an expensive school." Right, and I, I feel I feel bad about it as well, but in many ways, like I, I think it was it's showing ROI now and so on. But at that time, it was a very hard decision even to take that money, and I, I took that to heart a little bit. That I'm like, okay, I'm not going to do that again to my parents. And I think that's where Sweden comes in. I was that undergrad who was actually doing like research work during undergrad. I was able to even publish papers in peer-reviewed conferences. And I, very quickly, I realized that, you know, the research infrastructure isn't there. Like I got a good education, but to actually do cutting edge research, I need to, to get, get out of the country, right? And, and interestingly, a lot of the U.S. research centers that I wrote to, they were pretty kind of like, you know, uh, interested in the research I was doing, but they said that there is actually no real way for us to hire you because of the way uh, U.S. Uh, H1 H1B stuff works, right? That like only large tech companies, uh, if you want to be a programmer, like you can apply to Microsoft and Microsoft will sponsor you. But if you want to come and do research work, like we don't have budgets like that and, and we won't be able to do it. In Europe, it works a little bit different. I found an opportunity where uh, I love the people I would get to work with, but they didn't have a budget. Like it was a visiting scholar type of a uh, position, right? And I basically told them, look, I, I, I have a grant from Pakistan, right? Which I didn't really have it. I thought I would just get it. So, so you, made up, you, <laughs> ma- they, you made up that you had a grant from Pakistan and, yes. and you would go work for free for them, basically. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it actually is a, is a somewhat of an interesting thing, right? So, and is this, is this the university in Sweden or is this Princeton? No, this is in Sweden. Swedish Institute of Computer Science, SICS. And I basically calculated like what's the maximum amount of loan any bank would be willing to give me. And so I maxed out, so I, I took out that loan. I think it was like something like $1,200, like in dollars terms. Right? And, um, and I knew that I could barely survive for three months in Sweden on that money, but I was like, okay, I, I have it, I'll, I'll figure something out. Just the plane ticket was gonna cost more than $1,200. So, so okay, sure, I can, maybe if I get there, I can survive, but <laughs> I, I don't have a plane ticket. And to get the plane ticket, I actually, I targeted a conference that was in Europe, uh, got a paper in, and so that I could get a travel grant from, from the government. But there, there was some tricky thing where they would pay for my flight 
right? And I only had to basically figure out the connection from, uh, from Switzerland to Sweden. So I wasn't like lying out flat to the uh, research center. I did have a grant, but it only covered my flight. And the, and the amount of money I had, I would basically uh, eat once, once a day, like only dinner. Uh, at McDonald's <laughs> and, <laughs> and I would uh, I sometimes even like slept in the office uh, and I would basically in the morning they would have like free coffee and you know food and bread or something and then two months or something down the line I even I even ran out of like everything I had and wow. at times you feel like just giving up right like what are you doing all this for you're hanging by a thread you're working at a research center um, like you know you don't you can't even afford you know full meals and in the hope that by working with these top researchers you can actually publish high quality work so that you can go to like some of the top u.s schools it's like such a far shot right like what if what if you are unable to publish those things like what if you know even even after you publish the the good universities don't accept you or something like that so i remember a day where i went to the atm but then the card uh, wasn't working and I got like upset and I was trying to like smash it in or something like that and the card broke <laughs> <laughs> and this card is like from a bank in, 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 in Pakistan right there's no way I can replace it and I'm like sitting there like holding the card like, in my hands and I remember that moment as like a low moment in my life it just like that small thing just triggers like what the hell are you doing, right? Like, where are you? What country is this, right? Like, you don't speak the language. Like, you're. What are you? What are you hoping to achieve, right? And at that time, I did not ask my parents for support, even in those moments, wow. right? Because I, I felt so bad about uh, the earlier kind of like you know sacrifices they gave. I, I actually ended up calling a bunch of my friends, and obviously my friends like they're just like, you know early twenties at this point. They, they they don't have have a lot of money, but obviously they're they're really really true friends, and they actually helped me out. And later on, I was able to repay the loans to them and so on. I think I published some like three papers that summer. One in the in the top conference in that field in computer science, which is actually it ended up being one of the highest cited research papers that I'm a, I'm a co-author of. And, uh, and and it did open up opportunities. So I wasn't like completely crazy, right? I got a I, I got a, uh, a research job in Netherlands because of the work I did in, in Sweden. And then very quickly from Netherlands, I, I I got accepted at Princeton and kind of like moved over there. So it it all turned out well, but uh, it, it was a, it was quite a ride. I'm gonna jump ahead a second, and then we can step back and talk about the kind of the founding story of Blockstack and and stuff like that. But that feeling of just you're down on your luck, you're you know kind of rejected. This ATM has literally rejected you. You're on the street, just I don't know what to do, right? That 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 tough feeling that we've all we've all felt. When's another time that you felt that feeling since starting Blockstack? Oh, I think the the highs and lows definitely, especially in a startup life, like they're very. It's like a roller coaster, right? Like one day you're on top of the world, the next day things are going down. But there's actually a, 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 a value that we have at our company, and it's called like you know we'll find a way. And it's it's, it's it actually comes from 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 the same sort of mentality that no matter what happens, you know we we, we will find a way. Uh, so so like don't worry about it. I would say as I've uh, grown, the intensity has actually gone down. I, the second closest thing would be, I think the Princeton had this process of uh, uh, almost like they would make you do research work, but also you have to take courses and, and they had some sort of a competence, competency requirements or something like that, right? And if you, if you look at it, it's uh, effectively that y there are certain areas that are considered like part of the core competency of a grad student. So we are supposed to have almost like a... Um, a or a A plus in a course that we take in that category, right? But the the realistically, a lot of the undergrads also take those course, and undergrads are you know like these are Princeton undergrads, and they're 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 very competitive, and all they have to do is actually study for the course. Whereas I'm actually teaching courses, I'm doing research work, and I'm actually more interested in research work. Like courses for me was like it was very, I had to force myself to actually like study that. Mm. And, and if, you know, uh, 
you are not very competitive, like, you know, you might end up getting a B, but if you get a B, a B means a F for a grad student because you won't clear your competency requirements well, in, in the university, right? I, I think that time for me was, was, was a bit stressful and it just every time like I was, um, like there were some courses where I'm like, hey, it doesn't look like I'm, I'm getting an A in this one, you know, might as well withdraw, <laughs> right? And it was just like, and then um, finally when I was getting close to completing that, like it would be a little bit like, oh God, like, please, you know, let this be over. Like, you know, I know this stuff, like I'm actually doing research work in it, but, but I, I'm not gonna sit there, fill out this exam for like three hours and, and so on. Like, I think those were, those were like some of the uh, low, low points for sure. What was it like? You're this kid from from a smaller village in Pakistan, and then you raised from one of the top venture capitalists in the world, right? Albert Wanger and and Fred Wilson, and then uh, Naval comes in, and and you start raising mo- millions, right? Tens of millions of dollars. Did you, did you ever have a moment where you just kind of sat back, 11 p.m. on a Monday, and just said, "I, I cannot believe my life right now." Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think uh, one moment that comes to mind is uh, we, we lived in East Village in, in New York at that time. And at, at, during YC, it was actually, you know, uh, very interesting that a lot of people did not understand what we were working on. Like imagine crypto in 2021 is something people barely understand. Like, but at least they have some idea of like, hey, what is Bitcoin? What is what is Coinbase, the company where you where you uh, transact with it, and so on? Like this is 2014, right? Like you you talk try to talk to people that hey, this is what we're working on, and they're like, you know, this is, sounds like science fiction, or like we have no idea what you're doing. And and during uh, Y Combinator, obviously the the partners are super smart, and you know they're very helpful. But at some point, like you know, they don't have crypto expertise, and and some of them would actually try really hard to like sit with us and actually understand what we're doing. We were lucky enough that even before demo day, like we are, our seed round effectively got done, right? Like USV came in and took the round and it very quickly filled up. So on demo day, I'm actually like, uh, we, we didn't tell anyone, right? We are still at demo day, we're talking to people, but people could tell that Manib is just like relaxed and, you know, <laughs> Talking to people like I'm sure, they, casu- I'm sure they loved you. I'm sure they loved you for that. <laughs> the, very casually, and some of the batchmates are coming out. It's like you're you're not like really aggressively going after and talking to these angel investors or because, and and I was I was like some friends I would tell them that hey our round is actually done and whatnot right, and a lot of people they they would tell you that demo day is just a start of fundraising for them right then they go to the cruel process of rejections for like two three months and they they then they put together a, a round or fundraising and so on so i'm very grateful that we avoided that i was actually on a flight like very like like within a day or so back back to new york and i was in east village uh, walking around when i saw the notification of the usv money hitting the account hmm. and it was actually my birthday right so demo day is end of august and this is uh I'm back and it's my birthday and I basically just look at the the Silicon Valley bank uh, and it was it was I think it was a uh, close to a million dollar wire from Union Square Ventures and then we had some other money so we were we were north of a million dollars like in the bank right Um, and at that time like as you're describing it, it felt like a ton of money right it was like oh my god like where there is there we we can execute now. We're good. Like it's like we're good for <laughs> for a long time. We didn't realize like how how quickly kind of like you know money runs out and the kind of like the next uh, challenges. But trust me that right now Stacks trades at a five hundred million market cap. I don't feel anything close to that as I felt when when that USB wire kind of like came in and hit hit our account and I looked at it and I couldn't believe it. Right. I, I believe the 500 million trading cap, or if anything, I'll be like, hey, this, you know, like there's there's a lot of room for growth versus the versus the first uh, funding that we got. Crypto is really interesting, right? Because the one million dollars that you you got back then in the seed round, you're entirely in control of that, right? And you hire the developers and you control the code base. But at a certain point in time, with crypto projects, just naturally. Um, it's a protocol, right? And you're no longer in control. 
what what is the emotional side of kind of letting this project go run wild just yeah. naturally? So I think for us, that moment really came with the Stacks 2.0 launch. And, and for us, like the project has always been open source and even Stacks 1.0 was built on Bitcoin and, you know, it's decentralized that way. But I think because of the way we approach securities regulations, so we were the first project that actually got a SEC qualification for doing a token offering. This was a framework where anyone, anyone in the U.S., uh, even you don't have to be an accredited investor, uh, could actually purchase crypto tokens and the SEC actually qualified that. So it was, it was huge industry news. But because that we followed such framework, we also had to be very explicit about decentralization, right? Like in the sense that my company does not control the network. And the moment of truth really for that was, are miners going to show up and launch this network independently? So it, it was a little bit like, you know, independent miners came and they met the threshold and they run and operate the network. And maybe, maybe they wouldn't show up, right? It was not that I, I was feeling like, uh, oh, I had all this control or, or I actually feel relieved. And um, it's a little bit like, uh, it's not my responsibility. Like it, it is a decentralized ecosystem with so many different entities and so many different developers. And like uh, it trades in the US now, but OKCoin pretty much did their own uh, legal analysis and decided to go list it. Like we don't have a listing agreement with the company. And I feel good about that. Like I'm not, I'm not trying to, uh, I'm not trying to make this happen. It's a little bit like it's a, it's a truly open source decentralized project and many different people are playing different roles in it. And our our role or my company's role uh, is going to be on developer tooling, which is something that we are very passionate about and we feel like we have the right skill set uh, to, to build the developer tooling on, on top of the Stacks blockchain. You mentioned the the you know legal offering you guys did the first I think first ever reggae offering which was just kind of incredible to watch from the sidelines. You also mentioned YC. Do you ever have FOMO uh, or like envy of folks like you know other y, you know Brian or Peter? Uh, Bri- you know Brian's company. I think Coinbase in the private markets right now is seventy seven billion dollar valuation. Do you ever think that could have been us? Yeah, so not specifically for Coinbase, right? Because we have, we have never tried uh, building an exchange. But there are two things like where sometimes like your, your mind goes to, like I, I'm, I'm a big Bitcoin believer. I've been, I've been, I've been kind of like, you know, buying Bitcoin since it, it was like $90. And I, I'm, I still buy, right? like I, I still buy when, when it's like, I think my last purchase was 40,000 uh, price. But it, your mind does go back that hey look you 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 could have actually <laughs> seen the potential a lot more like I I saw it right but I I, I participated in it but it, your your mind definitely goes back that look like come on you were there right and like why are you buying Bitcoin at forty thousand like I have been buying throughout but those kind of thoughts like come to you that that's fine uh, the other one is actually more around um, Ethereum actually right like in the sense that a lot of credit goes to kind of like Vitalik and the uh, and the Ethereum community, but I, I read the Ethereum paper like before it was published. Like someone forwarded me an email, right? And we are just fundamentally in a different technical camp from Ethereum. Like our smart contract language is 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 almost like the opposite of Solidity. Our scaling kind of like solutions are opposite of uh, Ethereum. Like your our belief that. You know, all of these things would happen on Bitcoin is opposite of that, where Ethereum is a separate network. But it's a little bit like, you know, seeing Ethereum just uh, jump in with solutions that might not be technically perfect, but they are available to people and actually gaining more developer attention. And same with securities regulations, right? Like uh, the Ethereum sale was probably a illegal securities offering right and and they and they got away with it uh whereas like imagine the amount of work we had to do on our sec qualified offering right so i think where my mind goes is uh like imagine we did two plus years of research with people who have worked at like microsoft research compiler group to invent a programming language we feel is safe uh, to write smart contracts and because you're dealing with you know millions of hundreds of millions of dollars of money on over here 
Ethereum pretty much like, you know, let's take JavaScript, modify it a little bit and just run with it, right? So I think, and, mm -hmm. and it, if, if anything, if you look at the market, uh, uh, market caps or even developer adoption, uh, you could easily make the case that, you know, that approach is working better. Uh, that just, just like, you know, don't worry too much about the technology and kind of like, you know, just run with something and try to fix it once you notice the problems. Um, versus the more, what I would consider a more thoughtful approach of like really thinking through what should be the legal framework, what should be the programming language, what does the world look like in, in the long term. And I, I truly do believe that, I think uh, it's a little bit like, I think the decisions that we have made uh, help us be on a much more solid foundation. And then, you know, we will get the benefits from them down the road. It's a little bit like doing the hard work up front. Like, I don't think our team could have shipped something that we weren't comfortable with shipping, right? But we did ship like a, a month ago, right? The Stacks 2 is our, our master design. Some of the, uh, you know, solidity problems and hacks and the kind of stuff that has happened on Ethereum, you could actually blame the design of solidity itself, or you could blame, uh, you know, the design of Ethereum for, for certain things. And I think they don't come from a deep computer science background. There's a, it's a little bit like from a, from a computer science research perspective, like all the people working on Ethereum pretty much were pretty much outsiders, right? And they, they're like, we, uh, and in some ways, like it's, it's good to see like them come in and actually build something that works out in the market. And then they're dealing with fires. They're dealing with ongoing fires and they're trying to build uh, ETH2 and, and so on. You're very bullish on Bitcoin and you've been building on Bitcoin instead of, you know, kind of Ethereum. And you've got this wildly innovative thing where you're building on top of, you know, kind of smart contracts on top of Bitcoin. Everything would point to you are trying to help Bitcoin and you're a firm believer in Bitcoin. When I open up Twitter, uh, you know, because you did a reggae offering, everything's very transparent, right? So things like how many users you have, you, you're more transparent than 99% of crypto companies. What that opens you up to is a lot of, uh, you know, researchers. And I, I read something with Larry Cermak over at the block that, you know, they weren't being too kind to you guys. If, if I was in your position, it would piss me off to no avail, for lack of a better word, seeing people say, you know, that you're not trying to really support Bitcoin and that you're not a Bitcoiner and that you're, you know, you're not building a successful company here. How, what, what goes through your head when, when this happens on Twitter? Like, think of it this way. Um, <laughs> we are the, we are the <laughs> only crypto project that actually followed regulations, almost like innovated and, and figured out legal frameworks for how to do it. And we were so transparent that every single detail or business agreement that my company has entered into uh, financials or you know information about the board or officers and salaries and ownership, every single thing is disclosed like this is again like i think doing the hard things and the right things and not seeing results like the next day right like the shortcuts and the easy things give you results like the next day right and this is what people need to realize uh which is actually a little bit of a ethereum versus our approach comparison frankly right uh like imagine that when we did the we did the offering and then uh EOS got a slap on the wrist. They got a 25 million fine and they kind of like got away. And, and analysts out in the, in the crypto world were like, hey, this is, if I was, I was block stack, I would be feeling really bad because we did all this work and look, you know, EOS got away with it. Well, what happened with Telegram? Like they were literally shut down when, when, when the SEC enforcement happened, right? Uh, what happened with Ripple, like the lawsuit that uh, that you would never want to be on the receiving end of a lawsuit right? like like Ripple or getting delisted from Coinbase and, 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 and things like that, right? But those things take time. We kept getting criticized initially until people go like, oh, that's why Muneeb was doing this, you know? And I think the same thing, same thing goes for uh, where some of the scalability research. Like we have seen the troubles with building ETH2 or, or how uh, it's been like four years or something like that, right? And, and, and bringing something to market that can actually uh, scale out, that has a safe programming language. And, but again, in the end, if you look at the history of, of, uh, of crypto, 
like the top 10, 30 projects, they come and go. The only constant thing in crypto is actually Bitcoin, right? So if you're, if you're building for the long term, if you're building for, uh, you know, 10 plus years or 50 plus years, the design is that, look, most things are going to converge on top of Bitcoin. I might be wrong, like, you know, th but this is my thesis. This is our thesis that uh, we think that Bitcoin is here to stay. We think that smart contracts would happen on top of Bitcoin in one shape or form or, or some way. And we actually think that that is the lasting design that might actually stick versus some smaller blockchain that became popular at some point and then kind of like frizzled out, right? And, and I think if, if I'm right, like th this will again be like, you know, we were contrarian and we took our time, but in the end, we, we, we ended up being right. I have one last question here and then we'll get into uh, kind of uh, some quick ra rapid fire. I, uh, I, I met your co-founder, uh, Ryan, a few years back. And then, you know, Ryan kind of got pushed out or left. H how tough was this for you? Like, how tough was it dealing with, you know, I, we have a co-founder as well. You know, one of my best friends, Mike Ippolito. And, you know, I couldn't imagine building Blockworks without him. How tough was that for you going through, you know, Ryan leaving Stacks or Blockstack? Ryan really shines uh, in creative ideas, in building applications, and actually building uh, kind of like, you know, solving very creative problems. And I think like there's actually a, a lot of role to be played, especially with the launch of Stacks 2.0, where a lot of these applications and these ideas uh, can come to life. And I think he's con his made in a lot of contributions to the project over the time, even to some of the, some of the design decisions and so on. Like, I think there are so many companies I know of where they would have a meeting with Ryan and they would actually like end up adjusting where they're going and end up building a product that people really, really love. Right. So there's actually like a almost like a culture of hmm. this understanding that, hey, uh, this is a decentralized ecosystem and you can actually go off and, and do interesting things in the ecosystem itself. So I think this this, this is a little bit different from uh, you're building a single company and, you know, somebody leaves that company. Whereas uh, I, 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 I think the last I caught up with Ryan, like he has interesting ideas around potentially funding applications. I think he could actually really, really shine there where he's helping um, companies which are very small scale, early stages. I think he got very excited about like those stages of the company and helping them build things on top of stacks. I think, I think he is probably launching some sort of a initiative where uh, people, people can uh, almost like ask for investment or help and guidance in that way, which could be super helpful for our ecosystem. For the rapid fire, I'd love for you to make a prediction for just what kind of Web 3.0 looks like maybe five years from now. I know you uh, you and me have kind of interacted a few times on Clubhouse. I know that there's kind of a Clubhouse being built on, I think it's on the Stacks ecosystem right now. What are the, is this how Web 3.0 gets adoption? Is, you know, people just say, there's Clubhouse here. Oh, there's Clubhouse here. I'm going to go to the new Clubhouse. My thesis is obviously that Bitcoin is a very, very foundational layer of that. And so imagine that Bitcoin almost like solidifies itself as a clear like store of value. I, I do think there's still some tension where people go like, should I buy Bitcoin or should I buy something else? And I think they confuse it that the something else that you're buying is actually either like gas for smart contracts or it's some sort of a DeFi protocol. And these things are very different, almost like categories. Bitcoin is a store of value and it actually doesn't have a lot of competition in crypto right now. I think I would love to see five years from now, uh, things become very clear that it's just like, you know, we no longer ask the question that should I go to AOL or, you know, some other network or the internet, everyone just goes to the internet. So I think Bitcoin kind of like becoming like that, that, hey, look, you know, Bitcoin is the only uh, reserve sovereign kind of like, you know, asset out there and, and you buy that to really uh, have have your own uh, kind of like, you know, store of value on the internet. But then I think one thing that um, is not happening that much is the rest of the, this crypto internet actually settling on Bitcoin, right? I do think the Bitcoin use case is coming out very clearly with the corporate treasuries kind of like buying Bitcoin and, and so on. But the, the, the rest of the internet is not treating Bitcoin as almost like a TCP IP layer where you can build things on top of it. What they're doing is they're building those things on separate networks. And I think that is that is actually the fundamental difference between Stacks and, and 
other other projects out there. Where what we are saying is, uh, Bitcoin is like TCP/IP. Uh, Stacks brings like a smart contract layer on top, a storage layer, an authentication layer, and you can you can make things programmable and almost build a crypto internet on on top of Bitcoin. And I do think five years from now, even if I'm wrong, we will have an answer to that. Right? The answer might be that you know that thing ended up being Ethereum two or some new blockchain that was neither Bitcoin or or Ethereum. Uh, but I'm I'm fairly in the camp that it's going going to be Bitcoin and it's going to be on top of Bitcoin. We'll wrap it up with two questions. What founder do you admire right now who, you know, inside or outside of crypto, who might be a little less known, right? Not not the Elon Musks of the world. Uh, I don't know if Patrick Collison would qualify for being less known. I mean, Stripe. He, he, he is the CEO of Stripe, but I'm constantly amazed by how thoughtful, how intelligent he is and how how he's building the company. It's hard enough to find people who think in like five, 10 year timelines. Like he sometimes is thinking about uh, Stripe in the context of like, you know, a hundred years, like what would happen uh, in a hundred years? How do you build a, uh, a almost like a uh, company like HP or something like that, right? Like that can actually survive for a very, very long time. And, and the kind of, kind of it, it, it's also like anything that they touch, no matter what kind of like area they enter, they just end up winning there. Like I, I don't, I don't, I don't think I'm aware of a Stripe initiative that failed. Right? Like they would, they, would, they would launch an initiative and it's just it's just successful. What do you want to be remembered for, Manib? Um, I think at this point it's pretty clear that it's the it's the work we're doing with Saks. Like it's uh, it, it 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 has gone beyond kind of like you know I can't differentiate between my work and my normal life and my uh, social life or even my thesis. Right, like my PhD thesis was Blockstack. So I think this work is basically just part of me now. So I, I, if you would ask me the question right now, like my, my answer would be stacks. Amazing. That must feel good. Take it or leave it. You can ask me one question. Yeah. So I think uh, like what are, what are your thoughts on, um, you know, this changing landscape of um, large organizations or media outlets becoming less important, but individuals kind of like, becoming more important in certain ways. Uh, we're seeing that on Twitter with, you know, people like Pomp or we're seeing that on Clubhouse where people are like, you know, just, just just cut the middleman. Uh, we will we will directly talk, like it's a CEO talking to a CEO, right? And then directly uh, uh, people learning learning from these parties like directly. So how do you, I know you're, uh, you deeply think about these areas, but how do you think the world is going to evolve when this like shift to the individual is happening? First things first, I, I think it's a phenomenal shift and I and I love it. And I think it's really healthy um, for individuals to have a bigger and bigger say, right? You're going from um, three channels like ABC, NBC in the 1950s, and then more, ch you know, more channels. And then you've got the internet and then you've got media comes onto the internet. And now just the individuals have the control, right? As a, as a media company, founder, right? I, I think about it all day long. I think the future of kind of from a media, from a media company lens, the future of media companies doesn't look like media companies of the last 50 years or even the last 10 years. The future of media companies is, is just giving these individuals a platform, right? And sharing in things like the IP and the revenue. So instead of just going and hiring 50 journalists and an ad sales team, right? It's it's finding people who have a unique voice in the space and actually just giving them a platform, almost like record labels have done, which is saying, I'm not going to go hire DJ Khaled and, you know, I'm not going to hire the artist. I'm going to give them a platform. I'm going to make the connections and I'm going to basically set them up for success. And in part, I'll share in their success. So I think that's what the future of you know, information sharing looks like from the media company lens. And then, you know, from the individual's lens, I think this is only the beginning of the trend, things like Substack and, and Twitter and uh, honestly, decentralized platforms that end up getting built on things like Stacks, where the creators can actually share in the upside of the platform is, is really the future. So that's awesome. I think it, it really fits well with some of the decentralized uh, work that we're, we're seeing as well. 
I'm rooting for you, Munib. Thanks for uh, thanks for the for the time. I'm uh, I'm sure our audience liked this uh, this episode, and yeah, I'm I'm really rooting for you. So everybody, uh, you know, Munib's on on Twitter. I think it's just at Munib, um, and be sure to go check out uh, Stacks Stacks 2.0 what they're building. So thanks again, Munib. Awesome. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks. That was episode one of Empire. You made it this far, so I really want to hear what you thought of the show. This was episode one with Munib. We've got some amazing episodes coming out, but I want to know who you want to have on the show. Who do you want to hear kind of the behind the scenes, the inside stories from? I'm on Twitter at Jason Yenowitz. Just reach out to me. I'll try to respond uh, as quickly as possible. I'm also really trying to grow the show. I'm trying to get this thing on the homepage of iTunes, on the homepage of Spotify, and your small review of Whatever you want to give, five stars is always nice, goes a long way into telling the algorithm that this small little podcast is important. So again, thanks so much for listening and uh, see you for episode two in a week. All right, bye-bye for now.